So let's begin our discussion on the heat engine. So as we might know, it is relatively easy to transform mechanical energy into thermal energy. And one example of such a process is rubbing your own hands. So when you rub your own hands, you're essentially transforming the mechanical energy stored in the motion of your hands into thermal energy of your palms. So over time, the temperature of your palms will increase because the internal energy of your palms is increasing. You're transforming mechanical energy into thermal energy. What about the opposite process? What about the reverse process? Is it possible to convert thermal energy into mechanical energy? Now the answer is yes, but a special device is necessary and this device is known as the heat engine. So the entire premise, the entire idea behind a heat engine is to essentially transform thermal energy into mechanical energy. Now, thermal energy can be transformed into mechanical energy by a heat engine only if the energy is allowed to flow from an object at a high temperature to an object at a lower temperature. So let's look at the following generalized schematic of a cyclic heat engine. So cyclic simply means our process begins at some initial point and ends up back at that initial point. So the final and initial point points are exactly the same and that allows our heat engine to work continuously. So let's begin by looking at the following diagram. So notice we have an object at a high temperature and an object at a lower temperature and they are connected by the following section. So because they are connected and because there is a difference in temperature, energy will begin to flow. Heat will begin to flow. So how much heat will flow? Well, let's say it's given by QH. Now, when this heat flows from the hot object to our cold object, it will do work, as we'll see in the following example. So because in every single cycle we begin at the initial point and end up at that final point, so final point and initial point are at the same exact temperature, that means the change in temperature during each cycle is zero. Now that implies that the change in internal energy is also zero. So let's go back to this diagram for just a moment. So the amount of energy that leaves this hot system is equal to the amount of energy that flows into this colder system plus the work that is done by that system. So QH is equal to QL plus the net work, W net. Now if we rearrange this equation, we see the following result. The net work done by our heat engine is equal to the difference in our heat, so QH minus QL. Now let's make sure that this makes sense by using the first law of thermodynamics. So we know from the first law of thermodynamics that the change in internal energy of our closed system is equal to the Q net minus the W net, where Q net is simply the energy flow, the net energy flow into our system given by this quantity minus the net work that is done on our system or actually by our system on the surroundings. So because the change in temperature is equal to zero, the internal change in energy is equal to zero and so this quantity becomes zero. And we see that Q net is equal to W net and that's exactly what we get in the following statement. The net work done is equal to the net heat flow. So, there are many different types of heat engines and one type of heat engine is known as a steam engine. So we're going to discuss a reciprocating steam engine. So let's look at the following schematic of the steam engine. So we have the following boiler and in this boiler we have a certain liquid, let's say water. 
and right beneath the boiler, some type of reaction takes place. Let's suppose we're burning coil. So there is a flame, there is a heat source, and this flame is at a high temperature. So this energy is transferred into this liquid, and the liquid begins to evaporate. So the steam begins to travel from this boiler into the following pipe. Now the energy that flows out of this is QH. So the steam flows into this section and eventually ends up in the intake valve. And inside the intake valve we have a piston. So as the steam travels here it expands and it pushes on this piston and it does work on the piston. Now eventually as the piston returns to its initial position it forces, it compresses the gas and forces the gas into this compartment. So initially this compartment is closed during expansion. During compression this section closes off and this section opens up and then the steam travels in this direction. Now this section is known as our condenser and this section is at a low temperature and so as the gas as the steam flows in this section it cools off and it condenses and eventually it returns via pump to this section so we begin at initial position and it cycles back to that same position and this continues onward and that's why we have a cyclic heat engine so this is one example of a steam engine and it's known as a reciprocating steam engine so once again, steam passes through the pipes and into the intake valve, expanding the piston. As the piston returns to its initial, posi initial position, it forces the gas into the condenser where it cools and returns to the liquid state and travels back up this pipe into the boiler. So this initial location is our hot system. So the energy that leaves here in the form of steam is given by QH. So eventually it goes here and it does work on expanding, on moving our piston. And that's the network as described here. Eventually it will end up here and that's the QL. So we know work net is equal to QH minus QL. Now, earlier we said that thermal energy can be converted to mechanical energy by a heat engine only if there is a difference in temperature. So a temperature difference is necessary to drive the heat engine. But why is that? Well, let's suppose that the difference in temperature between this section and this section was zero. So if the temperature of the condenser was the same as the temperature in the boiler, the pressure of the gas at this location, this location, and this location would be exactly the same by the ideal gas law. So if there is no pressure difference between this section, this section, and this section, that implies that the work that is done on the piston by the gas is equal to the work done by the piston on the gas. So the work that is done in expanding the piston is equal to the work that is done by the piston compressing that gas. And that implies that the net work would be zero because this minus this would give us a value of zero. So this entire value, the Q net, would also be zero and no work would be done by that heat engine. So, but what actually takes place in a real steam engine is there is a difference in temperature and because there is a difference in temperature, there is a difference in pressure. The pressure is lower here than the pressure here and so it cycles in this direction and because of that the work that is done on the piston is greater than the work that is done by the piston to compress that gas. So once again, the work that is done by the steam on the piston is greater than the work that is done uh, by the piston on the gas because the air in this section is cooler. And so that means there will be a net work. And so that means the steam engine will do work